Welcome to the podcast that's dedicated to making you a faster cyclist, the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. And we have second place from the Mediterranean Epic with us today. We have Hannah, Otto. Hannah, I, this race, you, you got second. You won more stages than anybody else, uh, which is pretty darn cool. Uh, Four-day stage race. Uh, can we go into like, first of all, why the heck did you do it? Like, it's so like, it's like early in the season, big stage race. Like, <laughs> are you already going and ripping and this is just the plan, but like, why did you pick this race? And then let's go through what you learned. Yeah. Um, that's a great question. Yeah. I'm super pumped. Like you said, it went really well. Um, I, so this race is a UCI HC stage race. So HC is the highest category of stage race there is, um, which means it offers the most amount of UCI points. And so given the fact that Marathon World Cups are a big goal of mine this year and Marathon World Championships is a big goal of mine, I wanted to snag some points, but I also wanted to do some early season marathon racing. And like the there's just not a ton of... Just going to snag some points, show up, you know, <laughs> they're there to pick it up. Yeah. yeah, if Nate and I were going, we'd be like, uh, yeah, the <laughs> points would not even be in the cards. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, there's just... I wanted something that would really challenge me and test me of where I'm at right now as well. You know, going there and winning wasn't necessarily the goal. The goal was to go there and see how my training was going, how the trajectory um, of everything was kind of playing out, see where my gaps are, and then come back and fill those gaps with another big training block. And so I felt like if I'm going to go all the way to Europe, a stage race is obviously a lot of bang for your buck. It's also some good training. This race kind of launched my second big training block um, of of this off season, And so it just fit really well with actually my training calendar was one of the reasons I wanted to put it in there as well. This is put on by the same people that do Cape Epic, isn't it? I think it's like the, or is it not? It's like the Epic series. I don't know. I could be wrong. I'm not sure about that. I don't know. But yeah, it's, it's definitely like, a lot of um, like f four or five of the women who were racing the race are ranked in the top 15 in the world for marathon mountain uh, biking. So it was definitely a very competitive field, which, again, that's another reason I wanted to go is I wanted to compete against high level athletes to get a true sense of where I'm at right now. Um, you know, if you show up to local races and things like that, they can definitely be good season openers, but it doesn't quite give you the same taste of here's where I'm at. Here's where my fitness is sitting. Hannah on big stage races like this recovery is so important. How, what's your bedtime nighttime routine? Like after mm. you, you, know, you work so hard and you have all the things that you have to do and I know uh, when we've done stage races, John, it's really hard like oh. to wind down and go to sleep, but it's a really so big competitive advantage to be able to do it well. And kind of we're talking about recovery a lot this episode, I bet. And doing it every night is really the important part, right? Over a season. Uh, but so, Hannah, what do you what do you do? Yeah, you're, the word routine uh, that you said is super accurate because that's you just get into this routine and it almost starts to feel automatic and monotonous and. Um, the days go by so fast because you finish and you start getting ready for the next day. And then you're like, oh, my gosh, now it's nighttime. So, yeah, I would finish the stage, um, you know, do whatever I need to do at the venue in terms of like awards and all of that. And yeah, a I big know that. <laughs> obviously <laughs> things I don't need to worry about. <laughs> no. I yeah. guess it's go right to the hotel. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it's funny because. I think that that is could be a really important time actually to talk about because you cross the finish line. And even if you're not waiting on awards, there's still probably some lag time that you have at the venue. You know, you get caught up talking to people. Um, maybe you change your clothes for the drive home, whatever it might be. That time adds up really fast. And that is still recovery time. And so a huge focus for me in this race, you know, it's an early season race. And so I also want to try and practice things and learn things. And so one of the things that I was practicing was being really, really diligent about my recovery and therefore about my nutrition. And so a huge thing for me was given a stage race, given the long stages, getting in enough calories and getting them in as soon as I cross the finish line. So 
within like almost, I mean, within five minutes of crossing the finish line, I always had something in my hand that I was taking in. Um, so for me, that was within 30 minutes of finishing. The goal was for me to finish at least 60 grams of carbs. Um, and then within an hour also get in my protein. And then within two hours, I wanted to have like a full complete meal. Um, so basically that just meant by the time two hours hit, I needed to be back at the Airbnb eating, but everything else could be some sort of like drink or smoothie or recovery drink. Yeah. Um, and that worked really well for me. What, what exactly would you be eating? Like, can you give some examples? Cause it, it's hard, like a smoothie. I'm like, what I go to Jamba juice or what, how do I get it ready? And I know you have support people, but I think a lot of us age groupers, we don't have support people when we end. I've done coolers in the, in my, my car, um, after road racing for sure, especially if it's multiple days in a row. So what, what like specifically were you eating? And then also that timeline, I know there's a lot of type A people who listen to this. How, like, do you have a stopwatch going? Are you stressing about it? Or are you just kind of like, generally kind of moving towards the house and making sure you're making forward progress. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think a big aspect of recovery is also not stressing because stress adds does not equal recovery. Um, and that's coming from someone who is probably a very high stress individual. Mm -hmm. So I, I get it. Um, so no, I don't have a stopwatch going, but I think you sort of get in this routine and you also have to understand that time goes by so fast. Um, the second you cross the finish line, if you've ever like mold around the finish line and talked with people and then eventually gotten away, you'll be like, how has an hour left? Mm -hmm. And so I just feel like I have this general understanding that as soon as I can start consuming things, the better. So for me, right when I would cross the finish line, my support team would actually hand me a Coke. Um, and that would really quickly get me the 60 grams of carbs. It's just a really fast carbohydrate it's a source. Big Coke. Yeah, <laughs> a big Coke. Um, but then after, uh, I mean, maybe a little less, right? But then right after that, I would follow it up with my um, first endurance protein drink. So that's just their mix, that their protein recovery mix that they have. And that has a whole bunch of carbs in it as well. Um, and that's just mixed with water. And so, boom, that's everything I need for that first hour between a Coke and that recovery drink. And then I have a whole nother hour to get back to the Airbnb. And when I get back to the Airbnb, I would have rice and three eggs. Um, and that would be that for that first recovery meal when I get back. And it's really ideal, even if you can have a rice cooker and start that rice in the morning and have the rice Ooh. already made when you get like back a timer. to the Airbnb. Oh, as well. good move. Yeah, those good like move. those fancy Japanese ones where you can set the timer and there's one that like yeah. does the lullaby. Those are really cool. Yeah. Your, your <laughs> they're they're like a hundred bucks, but yeah, if you use them like for your whole life. Uh two, this is okay. I want to go in the weeds. I, I love when we talk about food on this, but one thing you said too, Coke right afterwards, it's so smart because it's available worldwide. It's mm -hmm. non-perishable. It tastes delicious. It's easy to get down. Um, the only thing I'd be, maybe you can get a caffeine-free Coke. Those are usually diet, though. That's, that's the one case is if you're already it doing a bunch of caffeine. It depends how sensitive you are, for Not sure. Not us. Yeah. We're fine. For the, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we were just talking about before. Jonathan, right? beware. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I um, get thrown off. And then on your eggs, like eggs and rice can be pretty bland, but you, mm -hmm. there's sauces. And a lot of sauces mm -hmm. too, you can put little hot sauces and they're, you can pack and travel with them. How mm -hmm. do you, do you spice them up? Do you eat them just salt and pepper or what? I put, um, typically I just like teriyaki sauce. So I'll just do a mm -hmm. couple of tablespoons of teriyaki sauce on top and salt. And for me, that's that. good enough. Um, yeah, super simple. And I mean, even sauces, like during this time when you're stage racing, you shouldn't be afraid of sauces and things like that. They actually can be your best friend if you're picking the right thing. Because for me, if I'm doing a carb load or for these stage races, it can be really hard to eat enough. And so you want to get calories through things that aren't necessarily taking up huge spaces in your stomach. Like maybe when you're not stage racing, you're eating a lot of vegetables and things like that and that's great but that takes up a lot of room in your stomach and so during stage racing one of the ways that I'm carb loading is every time I'm eating I'm trying to add for me personally I'm trying to add 15 to 30 grams of carbs every time I sit down to eat 
And sometimes that can be as simple as, okay, we're going to add some juice. We're going to add a couple tablespoons of honey, um, just really like almost sneaky ways to get in those extra carbs. That's such a good tip, especially like for carb loading as well. If you sit down to carb load and your idea of carb loading is, well, I'm just going to eat the most massive dinner of pasta. You're going to feel so bloated and you're not mm-hmm. going to be able to sleep well. It's going to be really tough. But that I like that that sneaky little dosage of adding in more carbohydrates in different ways all throughout leading up to and then all throughout a stage race. You have to do it. You just have to find little ways to add it in because it also like Hannah, you know, if you were doing the Tour de France, you might get really tired of those three eggs and rice and you get back mm-hmm. and it might be really tar- hard to get it down. Right. So but at least knowing that you have different options and different things to bring in, that can really help a ton. So it's super, mm-hmm. super smart move. On my IG, yeah. TR. Oh, go ahead, Diana. Go. Oh, I was just going to say. And, you know, one of the things we're thinking about as well is your calorie deficit throughout the day. And so you might finish the day having eaten and burned the same amount of calories. And so you're on par with your needs. But if there was a long time throughout the day in which you were in a deficit and then you're making up for all of that at night, that can actually impact your performance negatively as well. And so during these stage races, I'm also focusing on the frequency in which I'm eating. And that's why it's also really important to get something right away when you finish, an hour after you finish, two hours after you finish. And then, you know, depending on what time you're going to bed, every few hours after that, it's not just, oh, I finish, I eat rice and eggs, and then I don't eat again till dinner. Um, I'm definitely having pretty substantial snacks throughout. Are you are you actually hungry at each one of these times? Or are you more of like, it's two hours, I better get something down? Pretty much it's two hours. I better get something down. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the first couple days you might, for me at least, I might experience hunger, but the last day, especially in the morning for breakfast, you know, you're carb loading, you're eating a lot, you're probably eating a lot at night and then you wake up, it's early, you're nervous and you're still trying to eat a big breakfast. I mean, the stages are five hours. You need to eat a lot before you get on that start line. And eating my pancakes i was looking at clayton i was like okay one more to go i've almost done it like <laughs> it's race, the race right? before the race <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> you, we I, we said this a few times but uh if you know, most people don't have access to this but we got to stay with keegan on a stage race eating and you know that first meal we're all like oh we're so stuffed and he would just constantly go back again and again and again for more food and more food and more food and uh john it was like Oh, he outed me and uh, he definitely out at you. Nate eats so much, like compared to the average person. Uh, I, 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 I can't get Maybe that. Maybe didn't out eat me, but it was, it was close. And, but I'm like twice Keegan the size. Is, and Keegan <laughs> is so small. Yeah, he just yeah. kept going. And um, like he said, more, though. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> kept going back and back and back. But he's getting different things too. That's so key that you, what you said there, Hannah, about like having different substantial snacks. It's not like you're grabbing like, you know, a couple like like a handful of blueberries or something and that's like mm-hmm. a snack but you're you're having more substantial items and also you can see if you're thinking about this and you're thinking about how much you actually have to eat it starts to add up and that's why you really want to keep your fiber as low as possible when you're going through stage races like this mm-hmm. because otherwise all that food that you're taking in means you're going to have to spend a lot of time going to the bathroom and in the middle of a 5 hour race when you're like Hannah and you're racing for a win you know that that's that's you can't do that. So it's, it's super important. That's, it's not the time to look at your food and be like, I have a wonderful broad variety of color and a lot of like, you know, a lot of greens and a lot of growing vegetables. And it's great. This isn't the time for that. It's, it's the time to be able to get the food that your body really needs to recover and to, to go, you know, in race time. And a lot of times that food that you think is, uh, well, you wouldn't eat it normally. Right. It's mm-hmm. like the opposite, just like you're not going to be eating gels uh, during the day. <laughs> what like so this is what Keegan says. This is, I think, what we all probably do is uh, while you're training, you're eating the healthy whole foods, that sort of thing. And then during the race, you uh, Keegan variety, but it's variety of cereals like that's <laughs> cinnamon toast crunch, uh, <laughs> Captain Crunch. You know what I mean? Those things. Churros. <laughs> that Churro crunch. Norm- <laughs> yeah, tur- yeah, exactly. <laughs> Those things that you normally wouldn't eat. And that also helps with the palatability. Cause you're like, wow, this thing is, um, sometimes it's gonna be too sweet, but those, those kind of foods are like treats, right? So you're like, Oh, I'll eat a whole box of Captain Crunch at once. And the other one is juice, man. When I would carb load and try to get 800 grams of carbs in a day, it's really hard to do, but 
uh, tart cherry juice. And then my new kick is fresh pressed orange juice. Like you just, mm-hmm. I get it at a grocery store rather than the uh, simply orange juice. That's really great. But the, just get it fresh to family world. That's so time. much easier. We in, you get so we much were, and it's easy. Yeah. And we were right by Valencia. So orange juice, mm. like Valencia oranges, oranges you know, wow. it was like, oh man, they had fresh pressed orange juice at the finish line, like in the finish line um, oh, cool. food stuff. Oh, it was so good. <laughs> in my, uh, on my Instagram, tr.nate, there's a story highlight with uh, carb loading things where I took pictures and like how many carbs are really hard to do. Another one that's kind of fun the day before this isn't for traveling is, uh, uh, French fries that are air fried because you don't get a lot of the mm-hmm. fat. You can just do a little bit of avocado oil and then you do ketchup and salt and talk about loading your muscles with glycogen. You will physically, you do you get this too, Hannah, when you carb load you water and glycogen, you know, it goes into your legs and you're like, oh my goodness, my legs are banging. They're like, yeah. Yeah. like feel more muscular, <laughs> but big. they feel amazing too, right? It's such a, it's such yeah. a motivator and it builds confidence to be like, man, my muscles are just bulging out of my leg. And that's because they're full of glycogen and water. And then you're just going to explode that rocket fuel the next day. It's not going to make you fat. Like it's just going to no. make you fast. That's the. No. Yeah. And I think that's such a good point too, is I think within society, a lot of carb loading is maybe counterintuitive to what we're taught. I mean, we're actually taught you know, if we're trying, if we're trying to lose weight to eliminate a lot of those things, like, okay, let's eliminate juice. Let's eliminate honey. Let's eliminate sauces. And so it's very much the opposite when we're carb loading. And so we have to turn off that voice and understand that what we're doing, it's not going to make us gain weight. It's not going to make us fat. It's going to make us fueled and strong. And when I would line up the next day at races for these stages, one of the thoughts I was actually having in my mind is, there is no way anyone is is as fueled as I am. Yeah. And that was oh, such good. a good <laughs> feeling and such a good mindset I feel like to have on the start line. And so I wanted to share that sentence so that other people could could think that same thought because I think that's really powerful. Hannah, that's crazy. I've also had the idea that no one's going to out eat me. And mm-hmm. the amount of like, uh, you get this too, Hannah, when you're carb loaded, the RPE for the same power is significantly less significantly mm-hmm. the whole race is so much easier i can feel it yeah. when i carb load well and you're, you almost feel like you're like floating on the pedals that they they talk about you know it's like you have epo in your veins or something where they you know they're like he's floating <laughs> on the pillows it's just a lot of potatoes i've had well, a lot the of same situ- thing for fueling throughout the stage like if you're mm-hmm. fueling correctly it is pretty crazy you can hit hour four and be like did we just start because yeah. man i feel like i'm just finding my stride but- right now Have you done it where you think like your power meter is broken and you're like, this must be miscalibrated, right? You're like, there's no way. But then everyone else is like breathing hard and you're like, oh, this this is exciting. I did have a a stage like that. Yeah, it was nice. (laughs) Yes. There are times when I've been in breakaways or even times where like somebody will blow by me. And when they blow by me, I think, oh, that's fine. You're not eating like I am. Like, I'm going to see you really soon. Like, like, you know, like I know that at the end of the stage, I'm going to get really strong. And, and that was something that even, uh, so like the last, uh, last stage race I did single track six, then also at Cape Epic, this happened too. But toward the end of the stages, like there would be people in the beginning that would push harder than me, get, a, get an advantage on me. And then toward the end, I would always be making up positions in those races. And I don't think it's because I'm some sort of diesel that is like particularly good at the end of stages as much as I was fueling. And when you fuel appropriately and you're not, and you're making sure that you aren't depleted, that's how it works. I have a question. Like, so we've been doing this podcast. How long, how many years have we doing this podcast, John? Uh, since 2012, thir- 12, 13. 13, so We're 10 all- years. <laughs> 10 years? <laughs> Over 10 years. Oh my years. goodness. That's crazy. We got to like <laughs> crazy, go back yeah. and do some montage. But if we, it, so we've been saying this message, I've been saying this message definitely for 10 years oh, yeah. about the carbs. And um, <laughs> it's been, Back then, when we started, it was very much like, you got to make sure you optimize fat, like don't eat carbs, mm-hmm. fuel only, or like if you're, you know, only fuel for the work required kind of thing. Like, uh, don't think about your next day's training, if you know, on that day. Um, if you're bombed, then, you might want to take a gel. <laughs> it, it, it was a, <laughs> like, back know, like then it was, was a, the, that was the narrative. It was crazy. It, yeah. it was a source of pride to be able to finish a long ride on a water bottle and you'd brag about it to your friends, right? Yeah. That, that was the, that was the, the vibe. And we've been saying this, and I, I I'm going to say I, I got flamed a lot, right? On the forum. Oh, yeah. People, but since then, <laughs> yeah. I want, oh, go ahead, John. 
I was just gonna say, people were like, Nate, you're killing people. You're giving everyone diabetes. You're doing, you know what I mean? Like, I remember all those complaints being thrown at you. Oh yeah. You know? And I yeah. know. Anyways, um, <laughs> over time since then, we, you know, we've had, I think the, the, the narrative, at least at the level where we see it at like scientists, we have, we've had so many scientists come on here and like Dr. Pojagar actually testing to see what that maximum uptake, you know, up 160 mm-hmm. higher. We see, we have people come on who are the pro Peloton saying, yes, we're doing it. And like, uh, Tour de France kind of stuff, 160. We see pros like Hannon Keegan, top of the top of their game, saying it. Um, and then we have scientists saying that, like, or, or pro coaches too, saying this is what we're doing. Um, and we have age groupers too saying that we're doing. I want to know, is it still I I think on the forum too, I haven't seen as much. Is there still this idea in cycling that I need to restrict my carbon take and I just need to work on fat uh, you know, Adaptation. burning yeah, fat adaptation rather than like fueling so I can be consistent in training, recover well. Uh, it's still you know, there. I'm not saying you need a carb load every day or anything like that. And yeah. th- th- there's there's some splitting hairs in this stuff too. I, I'm not saying that every day you want to do 800 grams. It's almost like the, I am awesome for not eating carbs or carbs will make me slow or carbs will make me sick if I'm this high level cyclist. Um, I don't, I don't really, I don't really know. What do you, what do you two think? I think it's still there. What do you think, Hannah? Because I see it even even it and i don't want to mention any names here because i don't want to ruffle any feathers but like even some researchers that were like really famous before in the cycling space or endurance space that have like really like held on to these kind of like uh, positions there's even a, a couple of those people that really still push that narrative that like you know that you need to be low carb and that sort of thing there's probably that, and then there's that societal tide that we're constantly fighting. The societal tide that, for sure is there, right? That's definitely pushing. But do you notice it with the pros, Hannah? Because yeah, sometimes I feel like pros catch on to this stuff a little later than interestingly than like a lot of like the very like savvy and focused age first. group athletes, right? And like triathletes, triathletes are yep. like the perfect example of it where mm-hmm. they'll go first into this. And then you pros are so darn good that you get by without it a lot of the time. And like, <laughs> and you don't know how, like how, what you're missing out on and how good you could be. So do you notice it's still in the pros? It's interesting because I think cycling is a very traditional sport. And so we hang on to tradition for better, for worse. Um, And I also think then in the pro field in particular, we never want to admit that we're wrong. And so if we were doing something (laughs) originally and then something comes out that is maybe better, it's like, well, if I change, that means what I was doing was wrong to start with. And so I think people hang on to their own things that work. People are also afraid to change if it's, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But I think in general, we're seeing a huge shift and transition towards not only carb-fueled exercise, but really high carb-fueled exercise. I mean, I think only two years ago, we saw a lot of people fueling around 50 or 60 grams an hour. And now I would say it's all sort of shifted towards 90 and 100 with there also being people going above and beyond that. So I think we are in the midst of that shift right now. It's good to see because it's only going to make the sport faster, you know. Um Hannah, let's uh let's talk about I guess what did what else did you learn on the skills side of things? Like did you find that doing this race early in the season, do you feel like it's going to be a boost now because it was so concentrated in that short period of time with such fast people? Yeah, I think that for me, this race was a huge validation of a big training block. You know, I I think it's no secret that over the last few years, I've definitely over raced. Um, you know, I, I've known that as I've been doing it, I've raced a lot. And so a lot of my training blocks have been a lot smaller, um, you know, a couple weeks race, couple weeks race. And going into this race, I feel like my coach set me up really well. We had a huge block in January. I rode 105 hours. Um, and then we basically had a recovery week. And then this race and this race just set off this next block. And so now we're going to have another really big block of training Um essentially up until sea otter. And so I'm really motivated and I feel like I'm very validated that the training is paying off and also just reminded that those big blocks work. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm saying that for everyone listening, right, is 
it's important to take that time to do the work and not just constantly be resting and recovering and tapering and all of that stuff. Yeah, it's kind of hard. Like it's easy to get locked into that. I dream of like being able to put in big blocks, like for a lot of different reasons, but timing and scheduling alone, you know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I actually have this year. So here at Trainer Road, for anybody listening, if you ever want to work for Trainer Road, great company culture. We have unlimited time off. That's one of the things that we have for our employees. Um, that doesn't mean that, that we're never here. <laughs> uh, we all love our job and we love like building really cool things. So that's a really nice thing to have. Um, so, uh, but I've like made a goal this year to spend, I have two weeks tentatively on the calendar at different points in the year where I want to take like oh, that week off of work and do a training block. So then I can get in like, it just be really nice to feel like a pro athlete for a week and train and then like come home and just like recover and focus on eating really good food and the like, kids, you know? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the hard part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, um, but anyways, I think that that is like a, a really a key point. What about on the technical side of things? Cause you're focusing on the lifetime grand prix this year and I don't want to upset anybody at lifetime or anything, but it's certainly not the most technical series in the world, but I guess just, you know, that, that still pays off though, when you're dealing with group riding tactics and especially on like limited bikes, like gravel bikes, you know, you have to have really good skills for, for that sort of stuff. Totally. I think, I mean, I'm, yes, I think all of the above, you know, I think that this technical skills practice does a few things. One, it literally helps your technical skills. So for things like the marathon world cups, where it's going to be more technical, it does set me up for that. But it also just adds confidence, which even if the race isn't as technical like some of the races in the Lifetime Grand Prix, you're really comfortable and confident in your handling on the bike. And then thirdly, I think it makes you more comfortable with your ability to handle being around others. And so that was one reason also I was thankful that the competition was so high and I was racing with people every day is if you can descend these really, really gnarly descents on someone's wheel, surely you can descend Columbine on someone's wheel. It's sort of, you know, it, it mm -hmm. gives you that confidence of, well, if I can do this, then for sure I can do this. Um, and there is an element of, you know, descending something hard and then descending something hard six inches from someone's wheel is, it's a different feeling and a different mindset. There's a lot of trust involved with that, that I think it has to be learned. Um, and it also has to be practiced. Yeah. hundred percent. Uh, it's, it's always remarkable when I see, ride with pro athletes, how good they are at following some, following you down something that they've never ridden before and they can just stick right to your wheel. You know, it's, it's, it's definitely a skill you all have. Mm -hmm. Well, cool. Congratulations. You won stages three and four. Um, you got second overall, uh, you were fourth on stage one and then uh, second or third on stage two. So, uh, Ooh. super cool. Uh, shows the cool. recovery and eating, right? Four, three, know, one, right? one. Mm -hmm. Four, three, <laughs> one. Yeah, really like that's, it. that's, that's really what, did, that's a good question. Actually, Hannah did for three and four for those stages. Was there anything like technical or like, why do you think you won those stages? Did the, did, the, did everyone else fall off or was I, it a technical I, thing? I think I started to, so I think I started to figure it out. So stage one was my first race of the whole year and it was a time trial. So I think there was just a little bit of like yeah. time trial, first race of the year. You're like shaking off the cobwebs. I even finished that and I was like, uh, I had more to give and I just mm. couldn't get there. Um, mm -hmm. And then stage two, I was off the front all day with one other girl. And then her teammate actually caught us when we were sort of playing some games and they used team tactics to best me in the end. So then coming into stage three, I knew that those two girls were teammates. I knew they were going to work together. And at that point, I felt like I'd really put it together. And uh, particularly for stage three, knowing that it was like, OK, I'm going to make it hard enough that they're not together. And so I pretty much just strung it out from the get go. And that seemed to work to work well for me for stage three and four. I'm, I'm going to say you just were more powerful because of recovery. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Um, yeah. And but, sorry, I still I, a couple more questions. Bedtime. Do you do melatonin or anything or do you because you're in Europe? Oh, or do you question. just like sleep mask, cool room? Like how do you do? How do you handle the sleep? Go, the actual going to bed? Um. I, for me, the most important thing for sleep is having time to wind down. And so I'm just really protective of 
like the 30 minutes to an hour before I go to sleep, I find that doing things like planning feed zones with my crew is not something that I'm interested in doing right before I go to bed. Cause then I'm laying there thinking, was that a good plan? Did we miss this? Did we miss that? I have to have this really protected time where I'm doing something very relaxing or brainless, whether it's like just watching some TV or reading an enjoyable book. Um, and, and then with that protected time, I find that I can usually fall asleep. Nice. Yeah. Uh, I, th I think too, there's something to be said about for people like the stage races, both for like, we had this with Brandon at Cape Epic and for road races or a bunch of crits lined up for a weekend. If you're not comfortable riding in a pack or descending or something like that, going into those without the the idea of like winning, but just of like, I'm going to focus on getting really comfortable in a pack. I'm going to get work on my skills because you, a lot of times you get, you write so much more in those four days than a lot of people have access to, especially if you're just a normal person, you ride in the trainer, you got to drive somewhere to go to the mountains. Mm -hmm. You know, you can maybe do it every weekend, but writing them all in a row day after day after day. Um, and then being kind of forced to go through it is such a good way. It's a stage race on bike too. Like those back-to-back -back crits riding. Yeah. You, don't, you don't get that. You can't practice that even with, uh, even with uh, like group rides, it's way different than a 50 person crit with corners. You Big level time. up so fast. Like mm -hmm. uh, Brandon went into Cape Epic uh, with me at like relatively like a, if you even look at our prologue time, our prologue would have been way faster if it was Brandon on the last day. Like he came in relative, like I would say, you know, cat three level descending instead of cat one in mountain biking. And he finished and he's honestly, his descending was right there with like cat one mountain bikers. Like really, he's also an exceptional athlete and he's able to learn things really quick. But uh, Brandon is, go ahead. That's just cool to see like yeah. uh, what you're talking about, Nate. Yeah. So the, Brandon is our COO, chief operating officer. And he, after Cape Epic, he decided to run a little bit and swim and he run Xterra World Championship age group. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <that's>, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like literally what, 30 just 30 a little bit too. Or something. Yeah. I know they canceled the swim, but actually he's a really good swimmer. Um, he would have been faster. Swimmer. I think even he yeah. would have been great was, with the swim. So, And it was raining in Maui, right? For the descent. So he lost oh. a lot of time on that descent because he never really ridden in mud before in his life. Uh, but then it he was hard to walk down. down. It was hard to walk down the golf course, the grass yeah. part of the golf course. It was so slick and he was treading. So you'd be amazed. I wish we could do like a company Olympics. Cause our company <laughs> is so freaking fast. Uh, there's like, there's, you know, the, the South Africans too, the pros, like it's crazy. I know. Yeah. It's pretty great. I'm going to add one more pro tip for the recovery for yes. the nutrition yeah. is that I think a lot of the time when people are finishing races, um, you know, they hit maybe the last 30 minutes and they're like, Oh, I'm almost done. And so they stop oh. fueling, but oh, yeah. don't do it. And especially in stage races, man, I would take my last liquid shot like five or 10 minutes out from the finish and I'd be like, huh, I'm going to be so fast tomorrow. Yes. <laughs> Such a good time. That's it. So absolutely fuel all the way to the end. Um, it'll help you in the race because your digestion starts in the mouth and it sends signals to the brain, but also it's going to help you for the, for your recovery for the following days. Yep. And a pro tip for anybody that has like a big training days back to back, treat them like this. Like, um, remember that your fueling right now is going to help on tomorrow's workout. So, uh, great tips from, from Hannah. It's so cool. Uh, all right, Hannah, we have athlete questions that we're going to go through too here, but before we get into that, we have a couple of really exciting announcements that I want to go over. Two. Yeah, it's fantastic. So number one, new triathlon plans are now live at trainerroad.com and in the app, so you can check them out. And that includes master's triathlon plans, which is really what? cool. It's a big popular request from a lot of you after you receive master's cycling plans or launched master's cycling plans. But I want to go through the changes with all the plans, and I'll talk about like the specific master's plans that are unique too. But so previously for our triathlon plans, if you're doing sprint or full distance or anything in between that, the the length of the different plans would change. And now they're all standardized to eight weeks. And what that does is that makes it really easy for you to, let's say that you're doing a half Ironman and then you're going to switch to a full or you're going to switch to an Olympic. It makes it really easy to just swap those blocks in and out on your calendar because they're all the same length. It really helps. We also standardize the load to deload ratio. Uh, so basically what that means is like three weeks of building up in your training and then one week of easing off or recovery week. So that means that every fourth week is going to be a recovery week with the normal triathlon plans. And that that's also been standardized across the board. If you're following a master's plan, it's going to be every third week. So you'll have two weeks of loading, then one week of deloading. So every third week will be a recovery week. Um, and we'll get into that in just a little bit and the difference there. But 
In addition to that, we also looked through and made recovery makes weeks more restful. We analyzed the progressions of swim, bike, and run and made sure that they were uh, improved. We, based on athlete feedback, based on data, we're able to go through and look at these things and we changed them up. For uh, runs in particular, we altered the starting point and then the end point for a lot of the runs. So then that way you didn't jump into things with like really hard full distance runs, for example, and you weren't jumping in at two hours, but it was actually bringing you up in a nice linear fashion to where you need to go. Um, and then in addition to that, we also adjusted how plan builder periodizes your training with all this as well. We improved that. So all really cool stuff. And you can go and check out those plans. Here's the cool part. If you're following a training plan right now, a triathlon plan, you don't have to do anything after your next recovery week. It's automatically going to update for you. It's like magic. Um, if you want to put those in place right now, you can actually just reach out to our support team. They're awesome. Like Nate said, some of them are really fast pro athletes uh, from around the world. They all know what they're doing. They're great people. And they will be able to just switch things over for you if you want to get it switched over even sooner uh, before here at the end of your next recovery week. But you can go check that stuff out now. It's really exciting. Big uh, thanks to our team too, uh, to the team that worked on this. It was a lot of work. Like I know from the outside into my son, like, oh, cool, new plans. It's a huge amount of work um, to, to get these sort of plans out. So, and to have everything work well with adaptive training and all that stuff. So uh, kudos to Sean and, and the whole team there. It was really great. Uh, Nate. We have well, another very well, exciting. We're going to talk about this. Oh. The key part about this too is like so masters. Mm -hmm. and we say masters, but this is anyone who is maybe um, needs extra recovery, right? It doesn't have to be a certain age, and it doesn't have to be necessarily thirty five either. Um, mm -hmm. But on so the cycling side, what we would do is we reduced three intense workouts to two per week, right? And we still have a three week load, one week recovery. Um, for triathlon, if you start cutting out some of those days, you're yeah, you're training three sports and you're going to miss like a sport once a week. So instead of doing that approach, what we do is we add a recovery week one week sooner. So you're two weeks uh, work, one week recovery. And I know like the first thing I said is like, wow, I want that on cycling, right? Cycling. Or maybe yeah. I want both. I want two intense workouts per week and then I want a rest week every third week. Um, that we have to do more work for that to go over to cycling. And it's really technical with just how some legacy stuff is built in the plans. Um, so I know that will be a feature request in the forum. If you do really want that, let us know the louder people are on that thing, the higher be prioritized. Um, but for, for triathlon, it's really cool to go to the two to one and, you know, triathlon is all about, especially in the longer distance, building up volume over time, recovering, recovery is so important and you don't want to burn out ahead of time. Um, I think some of you have seen me on the forum and stuff. We have this thing we're going to talk about next, which is red light, green light is actually in early access now and anyone can turn it on. And the reason why we built this is, um, well, let me tell you what red light, green light does. It, yeah. what it does is it helps you prevent from being burned out. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it, what happens is on your calendar on days where we detect that you might be a little more fatigued, you'll either get a yellow day or a red day. Now, they're not necessarily an evil thing to get a yellow or red day, or you're not necessarily doing anything wrong. Uh, but they do have some insight, and we are going to tell you how to change your training on those days. So a yellow day, what our advice is, is if you have a yellow day, you want to uh, either rest or we're going to suggest an aerobic ride. What we find is if you start stacking intense rides on yellow days, you're going to have problems later on. It's going to start leading to burnout. It's going to, you're going to start failing work because you just get overly tired. And, you know, it doesn't mean you're not going to be able to pass the workout. I think we've all passed workouts, right? When we're tired. And then a week later, you're like really tired. You're like, man, I shouldn't have done that huge ride last Saturday or something like that. And you look back. Um, red days are days that we say you absolutely should rest. Um, the only time you wouldn't want to do that is if you're in a stage race. And a lot of times um, people are going to hit red in stage races if you haven't really done the sort of volume that you've mm -hmm. uh that you need to really go through that stage race we look at a tour de france rider he didn't have a single red day doing the it tour was de france. wild wild and, and right it's fair it's fair to say that that athlete was uh domestique not going for like big stages or sprints or they're domestique and that athlete was also like very much prepared to fulfill the domestique role for three weeks which is pretty crazy. Whereas if you look at my single track six, I was yellow. And then on the final three days of the race, I was red. Right. Yeah. Um, but <clears throat> Nate, you said something, and I want to clarify this really quick. You said, we'll tell you how to, to adjust your training. Adaptive training takes care of that for you. So yeah. when you have, when you have red light, green light, it's not like you need to remember what Nate's saying right now. 
it when you have it enabled, you're going to get adaptations from this and it'll mm-hmm. change that threshold workout that you had scheduled. But maybe instead of doing that easy ride that you were supposed to today, you went out and did a big group ride and it turns that day red. In that case, it'll say, OK, tomorrow is best to have a day off. Right. Um, which yeah. is really nice. So and, and I know what people will say, too, is they say, well, so it was going to be a threshold day. So I did rest. Now, the next day I was going to do endurance. Right. So why don't we just move that threshold to that one because it's a key workout. And we might have some intraweek programming like that, but in certain cases that might be beneficial. But in generally, you have then the next day is going to be an intense workout. So once you, you know, you take a rest day and then you move that interval workout ahead, well, you just shorten the recovery between that and the next hard ride anyways. And so you get in this situation where you're always going to be, uh, it's kind of like this perpetual cycle. And so you just want to be able to get recovered again and, and train again. Um, it's really interesting. I just looked at uh, Hannah's career on Red Light, Green Light. And oh, cool. you, uh, you naturally rest on yellow days. Like you have easier days. And then on some of the, you have some red days and they're, they're days off. You just naturally did it. It's really cool. Oh, that's and then you great. Have some, you have some red at the end of stage races. But like we said, that just happens, um, yeah. especially some of these really huge ones. But we, I want to show you afterwards. It's really cool. Oh, um, cool. Another question that people have is... Uh, Am I doing something like wrong if I have a red day or if I have a yellow day? And I think we're, we're going to add uh, this product to Plan Builder to help pick appropriate volumes for athletes because we can mm-hmm. simulate uh, a training plan for you and see like what based on your volume, what's going to happen. And by the way, too, this is not CTL. The those understand this CTL, uh, TSB, ATL. That's not what this yeah. is. This takes into your training history. It uses this internal thing called a fitness score that we have. It uses workout levels V2. Um, it uses uh, the ML stuff that we do for your workout. Uh, it's it's a big combination of a lot of things. And you can compare it against TSP if you want to. And it's not the same uh, if you want to like make that comparison. Yeah, Hannah? So will this help you know, for example, how many days you need to take easy after a big race? Like, for example, if you race Leadville, will it show you like you know, red, 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 green, or, or however that works of like, you need four days off after this or however many someone needs. To an extent, because those big days, yes and no, those big days, like we just talked about, if you didn't eat the last three hours and you bonked versus if you ate the whole time, we, we've, it's funny. We looked at my Leadville and I think I had two red days and a yellow day. And then I trained and I was like, that's wrong. And then I clicked on my workout on the day that I did train. It was like, felt pretty good today. Did this. And I was like, oh crap, it was actually right. Um, <laughs> but on, on those big ones, because there's so much variability of like what actually happened and did you sleep? Um, listen to your body, right? Like just because we are, if you are tired, that doesn't mean, um, just ignore, uh, your body. And if, you know, if it says a workout, do it. Uh, another question is we don't have actual green things on the calendar. Um, adaptive training will just give you your training plan. All this does is it's trying to prevent fatigue. And the way I like to think about it is it's kind of like a check engine light. So check engine lights on your car. You can still drive around, right? You can still floor it. And somebody go, I could floor it today. That check engine light's broken. (laughs) It it, it means that in the future, if you keep doing this thing, you're going to run into problems, right? We don't know when it's going to happen. We had, uh, we went through the forum. We went through like 31, 31 people who said, train a road, burn me out. Um, and every one of them did not do a trainer road plan. Like they had part of the plan, (laughs) but then they did all these extra outside rides. And what would happen is they would do an extra outside ride on the weekend. Maybe it's 150 TSS rather than 90 that impacts their next day. They train really hard on a yellow or red day. They do that a few times and then they stop training. They go to the forum, trainer road burn me out. So hopefully when, uh, one, if people, you know, say these things, ask them for their career and their calendar every time, uh, yeah. That's a great way to say, like, just make your calendar public, show us. Uh, but the, two, be able to prevent these things. And that's the big thing for most people, right? The people who are, you know, there's some people who just like to um, flame us, which is fine. But for most people, though, this is to prevent you from overtraining and to allow you to do those big group rides, right? Because it's really fun to do that big ride on Saturday. But how does that impact my Sunday, Monday, Tuesday workout, right? Mm-hmm. And that you want to be able to have that live inside your training plan and also have the confidence that, I mean, some some of us, it's hard to rest and you know, you're tired, but you're like, should I be pushing through this? Am I just like weak? Like, should I be gritting through this? And this is really going to give you that secondary level of like confidence that yes, no, you should be reducing this workout. You should be resting. And over time, this is going to allow you to go harder on the hard days and easy on the easy days. 
Yeah. This is <clears throat> Hannah you, or Nate, you mentioned that looking at Hannah's calendar, she seems to follow this well, naturally. That's what she does. Mm -hmm. uh, when we look at the best pro athletes, that's consistent. When we look at the pro athletes that aren't, that did seem to struggle, we see that they're just like you and I that are listening to this, where we perhaps aren't as in tune with our bodies. We don't know when we are pushing too much and we're, we're too eager and we just bite off a bit more than we can chew. And this, and there's like a bunch of, a uh, bunch of really cool feedback that we've gotten from people. I want to like share a handful of these uh, from people. Um, somebody says, this feature is fantastic. Thanks to the TR team. Viewing my previous seasons, I was surprised to find that before instances of feeling burned out, there was mostly yellow days rather than red ones. So this is a good example, Nate, of like the check engine light was there. They were still able to keep going, but they just kept yeah. going, kept going, kept going. And eventually the engine blew. You can you go know? hard in those yellow days for sure, but don't. Yep. There's another one that says, love this. It's very validating to look back on days where I felt fatigued and decided to dial it back and take a rest day and see that there were yellow days at least. And then this is a really good one. This is where my thinking is starting to change. I've not been one to think much past today or maybe tomorrow. And this platform, meaning train road, makes it more likely I'll have those thoughts and be able to make adjustments after having them. And red light, green light seems to be moving my attention more in that direction. As the self-appointed king of inconsistency and bad ride idea or bad idea rides, I'm very excited to see where this leads. And somebody else said, it properly detected my over exuberance this past Saturday and flagged mm -hmm. Sunday as a red day. Yep. Um, another says I did my long run tonight and it changed my schedule via two max workout tomorrow to an endurance workout. Yeah. It'll be extremely it helpful runs. for those. Of, yes. That's a good point. Nate, um, this works. This is not, if you're just doing indoor workouts, this is looking at all of your outside rides, your unstructured rides, Swift your rides. indoor unstructured, whatever it is. It's looking at your runs as well. Um, we, we, uh, there's lots of opportunities also for us to, to add to this and improve this. Nate, you yeah, mentioned I'll, in the forum, um, different ways that you kind of see this going forward. Yeah. We have this other project, like we have in our database now, all the other rides that you have synced or all the other activities that you have synced, um, through Garmin or Strava, like hikes and skis and all that sort of stuff. Really the 99% of it are runs, swims, uh, cycling or weight training. Strength. Yeah. Strength training. Yeah. That's, that's a. Yeah. Common, little, little, it doesn't matter. The same thing. Um, <laughs> some people be like, weight training is Olympics, but it doesn't matter. Uh, so anyways, swimming, once we get that thing out, swimming will, will be brought in. Right now, swimming stress is, I believe, not in yet, but maybe just internally, right? But not externally to this early access. Yeah. yeah. But not to this early access. So <laughs> mm -hmm. um, that's coming soon. And then strength training, that is an important part to bring in here. And that's a little bit more to the track. Uh, your working sets and your your uh your lower body legs and stuff like that and that is important um that's not in here yet so also understand that if you feel burned out after strength training listen to your body and maybe reduce it kind of do the same kind of thing you can think of your own yellow day uh so anyways that's that's uh mm -hmm. it's out like you can use it yeah. it's an early access and uh you know there could be bugs and stuff but we're getting feedback it's really cool uh when when we looked at that the, the those people on the forum though it was amazing to see that it could have prevented burnout in every case but one case in one case somebody was just they're riding great and they failed a threshold ride and they said we over we over like we burned them out and they didn't train anymore mm -hmm. and I, I don't know why they failed that threshold ride um they got through like two of the intervals but they didn't have any yellow or red before that too that could be hmm. i don't know what it is but everyone else was like they were training hard on yellow or they were training hard on red days yeah. and that's the that's the really cool part is i don't this isn't a readiness score too. Readiness score is different. That's like, how much can you train today? And a lot of times those scores are their number, but you don't know what to do with them. Like I'm a 12 or I'm a 45, mm -hmm. but what exact workout should I do? And how should I adjust my training plan for that? And should I skip something? Uh, I, I am super stoked about this. And this unlocks a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, it's really exciting. Yeah. Another forum user said it was the closest I've ever had to a coach checking in with me every day, which is that's, that's a really expensive coach. If you have a coach, check, <laughs> you're, you're spending yeah. thousands. Um, uh, and you can enable it. Like Nate said, you can go to trainerroad.com, go to your profile, go to early access. You'll see like a little spot there and you can just uh, enable red light, green light, um, for now. And that's how you can use it. Yeah. And it's only thirty nine ninety nine per month. Just kidding. No, it's actually included <laughs> in right. trainer road subscription right now. Another cool thing, people going to summer, um, you do not need uh, to train inside at all. You can use Trainer Road 
outside by itself, get red light, green light, have all your workouts analyzed. Uh, we're working on yeah. making it so that you can get a notification so you don't even have to open your app about what your results are. But this is really cool for us as we're sometimes, you know, it can be a little bit seasonal for people leaving in the summer. But if you want to prevent overtraining um, on while you're riding outside, which is so easy, right? Not very often do people overtrain inside. You can, but it's a lot easier to do that five hour ride with your friends when you plan a 90 minute ride and uh, they're like, should we take a left or right here? Like left. Okay. And then (laughs) you come back three hours later. Um, Yeah. Yeah. That's it's the value I think is amazing to not, you know, we're 20 bucks a month. And I think if the yearly price is like $17 a month or 16 or something, 15, 15, I think. Yeah. I forget what it is. But uh, to be able to prevent burnout because you do all this hard work. And what burnout does is it steals all that hard work that you did and sets mm-hmm. you back. And it makes you feel like crap too. I know oh, I'm yeah. selling this pretty hard, but I'm also very excited because um, I can see that it would benefit a lot of people. Uh, oh, yeah. And it, yeah. We've said a lot of things no. on burnout in here and sometimes you can listen to us, but it's really hard to implement um, or it's, it's not, it's actually simple to implement. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's just you can second guess yourself. And I did the same thing myself. I look back at my calendar and uh, I train on a red day or train on a yellow day and then I take a week off or I get sick. Uh, it's pretty insane how it lines up. Yeah, this is like when you have a goal event and you're prepping for that, that sort of thing. And you're coming into like a your, your main the thing you've been training for for months. You want red light, green light, because that's like, it's funny how in those final two weeks, we can so easily push ourselves into situations where we're yellow and red when we totally should not be. You're right. Like, like we can, that week of the race, you shouldn't be in that situation. You should be fresh and ready. So, mm-hmm. um, I the, say this too. I'm sorry, John. I'm just so excited. I want to mm-hmm. say too, because I, I'm talking so much about this that I don't, no matter what, someone's going to come on and, and hate us for this, but it's not going to catch everything. I mean, if you, um, if you don't eat anything or you don't sleep, like that's another great way to get into a huge hole. You got to still work on your recovery. Uh, you still, that's what I was talking with Hannah. We talked about recovery. You still got to eat right. You still got to work on your sleep. You got to manage your stress and listen to your body. If you get sick to take time off, right? This is yeah. one extra tool that's going to help, you know, 80% reduce 80%, 90% of the of the burnout, but you, it's not going to be a hundred percent and it shouldn't be like that. Michael Scott, you know, office video where it's like, take a right. And you're like, it's, the computer says that. So I'm going to take a right and go into the, uh, into the pond. The lake. Yeah. yeah. We, we were going to make yeah. a video on this and we have to, we have to mention yeah. that because you should always, there's always a human aspect to this. For sure. And down the road, as Nate's mentioned on the podcast and the forum too mentioned, uh, we, we have plans to bring in other metrics from from different wearables and everything else and see mm-hmm. if that data, this is great because we have a good like comparison, but this is trained on cycling data to know what to do with your cycling workouts for cyclists. And this is and, why and, it's like so huge. And triathletes. And triathletes, of course, too. Um, the, the One other thing that I want to mention with this, um, there's like if you're familiar with something like uh, the, like you mentioned before, the performance management chart, Nate, where it's like trying to give you a score of when you're ready to perform with yeah. TSB or your training stress balance, you'll notice that that one kind of is static, like, and that just is what it is. But there are situations where athletes are like, well, actually, I find that I perform really well at a different figure, a different TSB number than I did at the beginning of the year. So it's all kind of tricky to track. And this is the cool thing. Red light, green light works for an athlete in the Tour de France, and it works for a person when they're coming back from training. Like, for example, I'm sure that I'm going to get a yellow day coming back from training now after not training for two weeks because of being sick. And it knows, but I guarantee you once we get into June and once I have a lot of training volume, it knows that I can sustain that sort of thing. So this is this is intelligent. We have a lot, like Nate said, there's machine learning models behind this. There's so many other things. So it adapts to you constantly. So it's really cool. It's not just like some sort of static number that it's trying to align you to. And it's saying, this is where you perform perfectly. Instead, it's a smart and adaptive and individual. It's really cool. And make sure you sync your data too. Because like if you don't have a history of your data, it's not going to oh, yeah. work as, as well. Um, what you will see too, this, this is common, is if you are coming back from training, you have time off and, and you start training, you're going to get some yellow and red days and you're going to be like, this is BS, I can do this. And you, I'm, I'm telling you, you can, but you're going to want to, I suggest to go a little bit, uh, um, be a little conservative. I, I'm, this is like, even just the, I've done this so many times The first two weeks of high volume, this is easy. The third week of high volume. I'm like, Oh no, I wish I had the two to one ratio. Like in the master's try it, 
it's to help you prevent from it, uh, prevent the burnout later on. Um, also, there is another cool feature that I think, um, so this is an early access, so it's not feature complete. There's other things we're going to put on to it is the ability to, we're having a little slider where it's kind of like the stock market slider where, or uh, recover, or sorry, investment retirement slider, where we have everyone set to like a balance between balance between like progression in your training and being, um, aware of burnout. And you're going to be able to make it where you want to push a little bit harder. Uh, you want to be a little more aggressive in your training with risking high, more burnout, or do you want to be more conservative? Um, this isn't a really a time, you know, you have a new baby or you move a job, you know, the things I always say, and you want to be focused a little bit more on recovery. You're gonna be able to choose that automatically. Cause I think we've all had that time where we go, um, this is the year I'm going to actually eat my carbs. I'm going to sleep, right? I'm going to go to bed. I'm going to get nine hours of sleep every night. I'm going to manage my stress. I'm going to really hit it hard. You're gonna be able to tick that slider up and be a little bit more aggressive. And that's going to give you some control too, uh, of where you want to be. But again, coming back from training, that's one where it's going to feel weird, Mm -hmm. but listen a little bit. Um, yeah, well said, pretty exciting. Uh, this is huge. It's a massive change when you're using like, uh, there are certain features that when I use them, I like, I would throw a little kid fit if, if, if our engineers took this away from me and this is absolutely one of them where I would be very upset. So just kidding. No, (laughs) no, 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 that's a horrible joke. No, it's, it's, it's amazing. How do we turn it on John? Like, so this is early access, which means it's not on automatically for everyone. Yep. Go to your profile on trainerroad.com and then you'll see a little tab that says early access and you click on that. Then you'll see a little, like a, you can just enable red light, green light right there. It's super easy. And it's February 15th, 2024. And yep. by the time you hear this, it might just be on your calendar. Um, in order to do that, you don't, you can look back in your history too and see red light, green light, which is cool. So you can kind of see how it lines up with what, what, what base you're doing. Um, and then in the future, it will adapt your training. And if you know, you're listening to the future, it probably is just on your, uh, your calendar and mm-hmm. just enabled. So you won't have to do it. Ellen's question that she submitted at trainerroad.com slash podcast. And you can submit them also uh, on Spotify. If you're listening to this, it's super convenient all in one spot. You can watch us on Spotify or listen to us, depending if you want to, you know, if you don't want to see us, you can just sleep your phone and you won't see us and you can just hear us. Uh, you can also submit questions there. It says it's very appropriate from what we were talking about. Hey coaches, I love your podcast and I feel like it has accelerated my improvement as an endurance athlete, even though I'm an ultra runner instead of a cyclist. I'd like to ask all of you for your individual reliable signs that you are overtraining. I've only been training for ultras for the past 18 months now. And if I'm honest, I feel constantly overtrained, but I can't help but wonder if that's just what you feel if you are training for ultras since they're so long. If it matters, I'm doing about 60 miles per week and about half of that is on trail. I used to run track 800 meters in high school and college, then did a couple marathons where I built up to around 40 miles per week for about two years. Uh, Thanks for sharing. I hope it can help others listening to this. Uh, So like very appropriate for the discussion of red light, green light of how to to read your body. And some of us aren't very good at it. And man, in this case, uh, Ellen, if you were a cyclist using trainer road or a, a triathlete, you'd have it all in front of you, but just the same, let's talk about the signs like Hannah, how, how, what, what are your telltale signs? Yeah, I think if I'm in a stage of overreaching, my two biggest signs are probably irritability. I just have a lot less patience with everybody Um, and also a lot less tolerance for like minor frustrations. You know, like you drop something on the floor and you're like, the day's ruined. That's it, you know. Um, and then also My difficulties. Kids are overtraining. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. So every toddler is overtraining. Yeah. Weird. Yeah, yeah. Give some carbs, goose. Uh, and then also difficulty sleeping, which I think is um, that's always a good sign because I feel like when you're training hard, you think, oh, I'm going to sleep really well. You know, people always say like, oh, I had a hard workout. I'm going to sleep like a baby tonight. Like, but if you're really in a stage of overreaching or overtraining, it'll actually be the opposite. You'll start to have a lot of sleep issues. Mm. Yeah, There's, I think that the difference between those two, can you kind of like describe the difference from your perspective, Hannah, between overreaching and overtraining? Yeah. So overreaching is necessary for gains. It's going to be a temporary, um, 
a temporary phase of training in which you're training harder than you can recover from one day to the next. So you're increasing your volume or you're increasing your intensity further than you can recover to the next day. And then you're hitting it again, you're hitting it again. But the key for overreaching is the word temporary. Um, That's where usually things like these recovery weeks come in. So you're going to overreach for a couple weeks and then you're going to hit a recovery week, shed all of that fatigue and then start again and you'll gain that super compensation and that's where we see improvement. Overtraining is it's sustained. So you're not having those recovery reach those recovery weeks. You're just adding fatigue on fatigue on fatigue. And at some point you'll stop seeing any gains because you're not resting. You're not getting super compensation. You're not going to be achieving your workouts well anymore because you have so much fatigue. And that's where people really find a spiral too, is they're training so hard, but they're not seeing improvements. So they train harder to try and see improvements and Mm -hmm. it's a downward spiral. Um, So those are two. The one thing I would actually add also that I think a lot of people see is I would just, this is like my own kind of thing I would say is under resting. So it's not overreaching and it's not overtraining, but you're simply under resting. And I think this hits the general population a lot because it it can be difficult to overtrain on say three mm. hours a week, or it can be difficult um, or what I can do versus what. So for example, you're saying you're running 60 miles a week. Well, for someone that could be totally overtraining. For someone else, not at all. So there's a lot of context involved. And one of the contexts is the under recovery. You could be training three hours of sleep or three, you could be training three hours a week and sleeping three hours a night. And this is a problem. That doesn't mean you're overtrained, but it means you're under rested and your lifestyle isn't supporting gains. And so I think between overreaching, overtraining and under resting, that's where we really have to start like combing out the fine differences. This is that's such a huge point, and it's actually why uh, Nate, you've you've brought this up for for years now. It's why in Plan Builder we don't say how much time do you have in your calendar this week to train, because a lot of people will try to just fill up any empty space with training. When really the the question isn't how many hours do you have to train. The question is what can you recover from. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's like such a key thing for, and I make that mistake all the time. So I'm not saying I'm perfect here. I, I look back and I think to other times and I trained a lot and I'm like, yeah, I can do that. But I don't take into account the fact that now life is different and it always evolves and changes. And there might be a time when you can train even more than you ever have in the future. So I'm not saying that it's just, you know, it's just, you have to be realistic with what life is giving you, you know? Yeah. The, um, on, Going back to red light, green light, but also those, the overreaching, it's those yellow days too. And sometimes, uh, if you, if you have some recovery coming up or vacation, it is, you can override it and do a couple intense days in a row on those yellow days. You just have to recover afterwards, to get that super compensation that Hannah said. If you don't have it paired with the recovery or the rest, you're going to get in trouble. Um, uh, for me too, the sleep that's Hannah, that's for me, that's like the first sign is you, I wake up at like so you fall asleep perfectly, right? Fine, right? So after races, you don't. But on the, the training days, you fall mm-hmm. asleep. But then at 2 in the morning, you wake up. And you're awake until like 5. And you fall asleep right before your alarm has to go off. Is that, is that <laughs> the what you worst. That, Right? Oh, is that the worst. kind of feeling that you guys have too? <laughs> yeah, I've had that before for sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And for Ellen, like um, I had sore legs for a year. Like literally sore to touch for a year. Um, and I did not probably eat enough or uh, that's crazy to say, but um, and then take recovery. And Alan, if you're a lot of runners too, I know they don't, they actually don't take those recovery weeks. Like Hannah said, where maybe they, maybe two with your legs, you need to need to cross train for a week and not mm-hmm. run or run 10 miles or ride a bike or swim or something, or just walk. Um, a lot, a lot of runners go, they go 60 miles every, it's like an addiction and they never do anything else. And it's, you know, the same kind of pace. That's a recipe too, for burnout. Um, Ellen, if your menstrual cycle has changed, that's also, uh, you know, has stopped or there's something irregular, you know, that's a, that's a good sign or getting stress fractures that you're, uh, you're, you're way into the overtraining area. Um, for men, I know there's kids, uh, listening to this too, but how you wake up in the morning versus a teenager versus an adult, that's another good sign that things are going like worse in your, uh, with your hormones. If you're overtraining, um, mood, 
uh, you know what? I feel like I have, I am not motivated. And John, I, we, um, uh, we're on a four day work week and well, some employees go three day training block on the weekend. Right. And I was like, no, please don't. Because if you do three hard days in a row, Monday, you're going to come in and you're not going to have any, um, capacity to work. Like you, you don't want to work. Wanna work things that are normally okay to do or that aren't so hard, um, getting out of bed, or it's like you have ADHD or dopamine's lower, um, doing the dishes or like trouble concentrating at work. That's a great sign that you're overtraining and it's time to, uh, to rest some. Um, yeah. I can't think of uh, g- general too. I can feel my like heart rate flutter. Do you guys feel that too? Like it feels like weak, your heart. It's like gah, 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 when you're really I've, overtrained. I've heard of that from people before and also just, you know, like, um, uh, people will see different things. It could be an elevated resting heart rate or a depressed resting heart rate. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, research has shown both of those situations can occur when people are overtrained. So, um, it's, you, you kind of have to just know yourself and know when something is irregular, uh, rather than knowing that down means bad up means good or something. Yeah. My action item for Ellen though would be well, one, ask yourself when ha- when was your last recovery week? Um, and if you don't know, then first step, take a recovery week. And like exactly like Nate said, especially for runners, recovery weeks, it's it it's hard to recover when running because it's still a lot mm-hmm. of load on the legs. Even if it's easy on the cardiovascular system, it's still load on your ligaments and joints and bones and everything else. So your recovery week it might even be an off week. It might be cross training. Um, and then if you feel good after that recovery week, I think you can listen to that feeling, get back into the rhythm and just be more consistent with your recovery weeks in the future. If you finish that recovery week and you still are feeling that sensation that you just said of, I feel constantly overtrained, then you, then you might be. And that, and overtraining is something that, takes some time to reverse. So that's when we need to take a step back and it's different for everyone. You might need two weeks, you might need a month, you might need six months. Um, but, but that's when we start looking at actually labeling it as overtraining and handling it accordingly. Yeah. I don't have anything personally to add. Uh, Hannah, my, your experience totally resembles mine, but my behavior resembles my toddler daughter's behavior. (laughs) That's definitely a situation, but in most cases, it's not the training that has caused that. And it's something else. It's because I'm not, it's because I'm under resting or under nourishing. The under nourishing is probably the most common thing that that I've bumped up to. If I look into the past where I'm just, you know, it's just uh, not feeling the work. And as a result, the body's trying its best. It just doesn't have a lot to work with. Um, okay. This next one, this says, uh, this is from, uh, this is from an anonymous submitter says, Hey guys, I hope you want to ignore my question since it's anonymous. I have a situation where I'm wondering if my coach is actually looking at my training and I want your feedback. Like, yikes. <laughs> hopefully there's no specific ind- identifiers here <laughs> or else that might be uh, yeah. Um, says like most cyclists, I've incorporated strength training into my routine, but I feel like ever since I've started that, I simply can't recover. I'm doing two to three sessions per week in the gym and not lifting anything massive. In fact, it's mostly body weight stuff, but due to my schedule, the only time I can fit it in is on my easy training days where I only have a 30 minute workout. I tried changing this to my hard days last week, and this week has been my worst week of training yet. So I don't think that works for me. My original goal was to add strength training so I could avoid overuse injuries, but I feel like now I'm just so exhausted. I can't train. Mm. What would you tell me to do? And this is, they break down their training. They're at 4.2 watts per kilogram, so fast cyclist. Uh, 12 hours per week is what they're doing on the bike. I assume you're talking about the bike training. Six sessions, so that's six workouts a week, adding up to 12 hours. 90-minute interval days, there's two of those. 30-minute recovery days, there's two of those. And then three to five-hour endurance or group rides, there's two of those. (laughs) Sorry. Endurance slash group rides, that's... uh, that's like uh, saying white slash black. It's the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Sorry, I don't want to. Yeah, but um, but that's really common, though. Uh, we've seen that a lot of people, like Nate said, with red light, green light. You can see uh, that endurance ride. Suddenly, everything's red after that because it, it's not quite an endurance ride. Um, <clears throat> okay, so Hannah, what what would you say to this? I I kind of feel like just switching one week to doing it on your harder days instead of doing it on your easy days probably. I mean, if they're already in a situation of fatigue, it's probably not as easy as just saying one week, boom, no difference. Okay. So strength training isn't for me, but I don't know what, 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 what advice would you give this athlete? Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because they are 
training quite a bit. This is a pretty big load um, for someone who has, I'm assuming, a standard job and a standard life, family, what you know, whatever. We're all people. We have things outside of work as well. Um, but so with that information, a piece of me wants to back it off. But their question is kind of implying that it's just these strength workouts that are putting them over the top. And if that's truly the case, then I feel like this is less of a training load thing and more of a time issue thing. It sounds like you're feeling really strung out by your lifestyle and by fitting in these gym workouts. Um, And so for me, looking at this, first of all, if it's just body weight stuff, you are doing exactly what you're saying, what you say you're doing. You're just adding strength to prevent overuse injuries. This shouldn't be a huge training load. So I wouldn't worry about doing it three times a week. Cut it down to two times a week. And then if it's a time issue, cut out those 30 minute recovery rides. Those are just active recovery. They're not making you faster. They're just supposed to make you feel better. So if it's a time issue, cut those out, do the strength workouts, call it a day. If it's body weight, hopefully you can do those strength workouts at home. And it truly is only a 30 minute give. Yeah, it's a, I, I feel like this is one of those scenarios where like you've filled the vase so that the water is directly at the top and any shaking of that vase is going to cause it to spill or any additional drops. Right. And it sounds like Hannah, like this isn't a small amount of training, like mm-hmm. 12 hours a week, especially if they have other things in their life going on. That's a lot. So uh, looking at that, I can't help but think that if you are trying to avoid overuse injuries, maybe backing off on your training a touch on the bike and then so you can fit in some strength training, but then also maybe that you just recover better, your body repairs itself better, and you find that you might actually perform better with slightly less training load um, well, than, than 12 hours a week. Two, does Anonymous, do they have overuse under training, overuse injuries? Like, good, good is, is it is it an issue right now? Because, I mean, in other sports, maybe in cycling, though, there's you can go a long time without getting overuse injuries. There's other reasons to, um, to, uh, do strength training. I think the, I like what Hannah said about dropping those 30 minutes. Amazing. I agree. You're doing so two 90 minute interval sessions and then a two, three to five hour, at least in the weekend, um, group ride or endurance ride. Both of those are considered like in my book, hard rides, right? Even if it's a, if you're like, it's endurance, but it's a three, four, five hour endurance ride. That's a hard ride. So you have right there four hard workouts per week, right? That's, that's legit. That's probably the max anyone can take. And you're at four, two watts per kilo or 4.2 watts per kilo. That's we're talking about the vase being full. Um, and your strength training too, you say mostly body weight stuff. I wonder if a lot of time when people do body weight stuff, it's got this aerobic aspect to it. Or this, mm-hmm. like, I'm going to take 60 minute rest, or I'm going to do like burpees or something like that. That's not the kind of strength training I think that uh, what I think of it, and it's more of, um, especially if you're getting to CrossFit and stuff like that. You those get, are it's so a metabolic taxing. exercise, you know, like you're yeah. looking at like that's like a another workout. workout. It's easy mm-hmm. to switch into pulling on the same strings. Honestly, and, if you're simply trying to um, eliminate overuse injuries, I. I almost wouldn't even make it a a quote unquote strength workout because that has this sort of connotation of I'm going to do work. Instead, I would do I would just create a five to 10 minute routine that you do before or after every ride, three rides, maybe your three really hard rides of the week. And it just consists of the classic things that us cyclists need. So some core stability to help reduce back pain, like dead bugs, um, cat camels, or um, uh, some bird dogs, and then some hip stuff. So some like <laughs> clamshells or fire hydrants. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can, you can put Google some pictures up. up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and then some hip stuff like for the glute meads, like fire hydrants, clamshells, um, and uh uh help me out with oh, some glute bridges. Yeah. Yeah, glute bridges. I, yeah. I, and I think that for oh and for me, I've I've had a history of overuse injuries, and I also now am proud to say that I have a history of not getting overuse injuries for the past probably five, six years now. And it doesn't take strength training for me to do that. 
it, what it takes is mobility work and, mm-hmm. um, and it's not a lot and it's easy to do just like Hannah said. So I'll, I'll link to that forum thread that I have where it's like knee injuries for cyclists on the forum. It's a huge forum thread. A lot of people talking about different things that they've done, but I'll show at least like what I do to avoid lower body overuse injuries. And you'll see, it's not a lot of, it's not a lot of stuff and it certainly isn't something that will tire you out. So uh, to uh, anonymous, when you talk about your strength training on your uh, interval days. You said it went horribly. What I'm guessing you did is you did it before training and yeah. don't do that. Um, do your, like your, your primary goal is cycling. I think on this, if, if you are going to add them, do what Hannah said, reduce them, but also do it after your, uh, your interval workouts. I know there's like mTOR and AMPK and stuff like that, but I honestly used to do this all the time. Um, when I got super fast and that was, uh, it was just fine. So maybe there is some kind of thing that you're losing, but try it out. And then you have a whole extra day, right? The next day is going to be a 30 minute. You have a whole day to rest to eat and your muscles recover. 100%. And then you go back in the next one. So I would do it right afterwards. And um, if you are at a gym, you got to limit your sets too. Like, uh, can I talk about what you, you want to say something, John? I want to talk about weight training a bit. Or? Yeah, I, I was just going to say it really quick. Um, and I'm going to try to find the link for this and put it down in the description. But I believe I just saw a... Um, it may have been a meta-analysis or a systematic review looking at cross-signaling effects between mTOR and AMPK. Basically, like if you do strength and endurance at the same time, then what it can do is it can they, they both work against each other, and you can't get the sort of gains that you want in one area or the other. You're blunted across the board. And they looked at it, and it was basically what it seems like that the consensus in the current research is that if these sessions are separated from each other by something like it seems like I think that the shortest that they saw was something like 30 minutes, but separation is the key. And when you can separate them from each other, you don't have to, the interference effect doesn't seem to have any sort of meaningful impact. It's when you try to do both in the same session and you're really pushing yourself in both directions in that same session that you don't see the sort of gains that you would hope to gain that I hope to have. So 30 minutes, that's pretty low too. Uh, Quite short. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, if you are weight training and so there's, there's different goals that people have, right? So a cyclist overuse, we don't go side to side ever. So that's where Heiner's talking about gluten med- media stuff, the side of your butt working that so that, uh, you know, that can make your knee unstable, which is crazy to think is that your butt does that. And that can, you know, have patella tendon issues. And there's all these sorts of things about, um, the overuse. And I think a lot of stuff that she talked about too, all talks about that core stability, if you're just a middle-aged man and you're losing muscle mass, right. For being older and you're like, Hey, the more muscle mass I have, the longer I'll live. Or, you know, there's that, there was always that grip strength stuff where the stronger your grip is, which I don't think is related directly to grip strength. It's more of a, a single of your whole <laughs> yeah. body has been strong. And the people with strong grips lift weights, um, <laughs> doing like, I, I agree that the two, um, two times per week and I'll do an upper day and a lower day. And I have the lower day earlier in the week, farther away from your, uh, your lower body day away from the three to five hour ride. So maybe if it's a classic train run plan on, on the Tuesday and I would do maybe after warm up, you know, four to six working sets total, maybe start at four, which seems really low, but each one of those sets is going to be to failure. And so mm-hmm. maybe, uh, two leg press and two hamstring, um, which you have to worry about too, with this is something that people don't think about enough that if you are doing full body stuff, squats, deadlifts, um, leg press to an extent is there's this neuromuscular fatigue where mm-hmm. it is so taxing. And, um, there's some like bodybuilders that actually do it in reverse where they start with leg extensions and the end with something like a Smith machine, uh, squat with lighter weight because they're already fatigued and they don't have to have so much neuromuscular, um, uh, fatigue on, on trying to get every muscle in their body, right. To, to push on that. And so using some of the machines and being more isolated. And I know some people say, well, you'll never get strong that way, but you can still get pretty strong and it's better than nothing. It's better than burning out. So watch yourself. If you're feeling really terrible after those days and you notice that you're, you did these really huge compound, uh, things, stop that. Um, machines are great. Cause you, um, and a lot of people are going to flame me on this too, but you can build a lot of muscle machines. They're going to prevent injury and they allow you to, uh, you don't have to be as technically good. You can just kind of like push all out on the upper body. I would do like a two sets of push, uh, like a, like a, some kind of chest press, um, two sets of pull, either your arms, um, uh, your hands either parallel or up and down and then two sets of overhead press and call it good. 
the I mean, basics. Uh, yeah, you can, I mean, just because that's I mean, so easy to want to go more. This is a good red light, green light analogy too. I've done it too. You just keep going. You're like, my biceps can get a little bigger though. So I'm going to do this. And then later on, you just get tired and you skip your other session and you're going to burn out. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's really limiting the, the amount of working sets a lot and limiting the amount of huge compound movements. If you didn't have yeah. cycling, we'd be doing compound movements and uh, talking about that differently. And I know when you, a lot of people be like, you don't do bench press, you don't do deadlift, you don't do squat. You're not a real, you know, lifter or something like that. If you don't do you dumbbells. Don't need to be. <laughs> well, yeah. Recycles. I mean, there's so many. Um, I've been getting really into uh, weight training and following people, and there's so many bodybuilders that look amazing and natural bodybuilders who only use machines. And they actually say the dumbbells limit them. And you know, they they do, um, they do deadlifts with straps because they're like, you know, my back is a lot bigger than my forearm, and yeah. I can train my forearm separately, and I don't have to then think about that. Doesn't limit my whole back growth. Uh, there's some. There's some like. It's really like cycling too. There's a lot of things that are like, you're not, you know, man enough. I'm using air quotes here. If you don't use dumbbells or if you don't do everything with grip strength or something, it's all functional, but you can get plenty functional for life and be super strong and look great and live longer and reduce injury. Yeah. And stepping back to the context of a cyclist, you just don't need to do a lot um, for yeah. strength training. So you're, you're good. All right. Last questions from Don Mo. Uh, this is from Spotify says, what is the trainer road crews take on collagen supplementation? Uh, I understand it's synthesizing the body naturally, but is there any measurable benefit from external supplementation? I almost just like completely went over this one. Cause I was like, I mean, it's probably going to like, I don't know, maybe help with injury, but I decided to look into uh, the research on this. Hannah, do you take collagen? Um, no, I don't. And when I read it, I had the exact same feeling that you just expressed. So I'm really curious to hear (laughs) what you've discovered here. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know for skincare. Did you cover skincare at all? We did not. No, that's type one and three collagen, uh, not type two. We're more interested in type two, um, but type one and three for sure. Uh, I was surprised. So, oh, so first of all, the basics of what collagen is, uh, protein that provides structural support and connection for our bodies to bodies, tissues. So think of it like scaffolding, like, you know, when a building is getting like redone on the outside or built or anything else, and they put up scaffolding around it and it helps support things and connect things. And, and that's more or less what our body does in one respect with collagen. Um, and it can help things rebuild. It can help things be connected and stronger. It can help things work more efficiently. Uh, yeah, we do produce it naturally, but you can also take it out on the, from the outside and from the athlete side, really, cause as you said, Nate, aesthetically collagen is involved in our skin. And as we age, we don't produce as much collagen and that's why our skin gets saggy and wrinkly and everything else. There's like the, imagine removing the scaffolding and things would kind of slump and not look as good. Right. But for athletes, and it's important to take care of your skin too, especially for athletes and they're out in the sun and all that stuff. But that's a separate issue. Instead, we're really focused on the fact that it can help us in providing strength, elasticity, and integrity to all the connective tissues that we have. Because remember, most connective tissue is active as as athletes. Um, there's that you know muscle and tendon and everything else that all works together. So. Uh, I thought about that and I was like, yeah, okay. So it probably helps us avoid injury, uh, but would it help performance? So I wanted to actually look at research on it and here's the research. First of all, there's very little research against using collagen, like taking in collagen, showing that it would be bad in any way. Um, Mm -hmm. so that's important to keep in mind. Shockingly, also research that shows improved recovery indicators was surprisingly rare. So that's like, you can find like creatine kinase or like any sort of like, um, markers that they typically associate with muscle damage. And there isn't a lot of research and it please find research. If I missed it, can you please put it down in the comments below? But it was hard to find research that was showing that like collagen supplementation reduces markers of muscle fatigue and damage in subjects quite hard. But there was one that I looked at that uh, looked at basically it had nine active males, split them into two groups, and three times a week for four weeks, they took 15 grams of collagen, and then the other group took a placebo of the same amount. And then one hour after supplementation, they did four short running sprints to simulate co- uh, to stimulate collagen synthesis. And then they tested their ground reaction forces when they were running. And this is the most common thing that you'll see people talk about collagen is like, you, know, you want to have like strong ligaments. And then what that will do is that like for running in particular, you'll hear this a lot where they're like, that gives you that spring in your step. And if you don't have that, then you need to have stiffer 
muscles, basically, is what they're talking about. In your lower extremity, you need to have stiffer muscles, and more collagen can help with that. And this one definitely, this this study showed that there were no differences between the groups taking them. And it actually shows that there, in some cases, people show that there can be some increase in bounce and that sort of thing, but it's never able to be effectively separated from these people also just getting fitter and getting stronger muscles as well. But the this is the surprising part. The research for shows that not just can it help with obviously strengthening things, but also like improving endurance performance. And this is why I'm now suddenly starting to think that maybe I will start taking collagen again. Um, these are recent studies. Uh, this is this first one's called Influence of Specific Collagen Peptides in 12-Week Concurrent Training on Recovery-Related Biomechanical Characteristics Following Exercise-Induced Muscle Damage, a Randomized Control Trial by Biscoff and uh, colleagues in 2023, so just this uh, past year. So they had 55 sedentary males. They split them into two groups, a collagen group, again, taking 15 grams of a specific collagen peptide, and then a placebo group, taking the same amount of a placebo. Uh, three times a week for 12 weeks, that's what they took. And before and after that 12 week period, they did an eccentric muscle damage, uh, or they did the, uh, an exercise to induce eccentric muscle damage. Basically they were 150 drop jumps. And if you don't know what a drop jump is, it's when you drop from a high, like from a high place land, and then you jump after that. Right. And they did 150 of those, which I could totally see that would give you the worst doms. Like it would be, that's an exercise that nobody's really naturally prepared to do all the time. It'd be pretty tough. So they did that. And then before and after the 12 week period, uh, they, um, they took these measurements. Um, what they looked at was the maximum voluntary contraction or forgive me. Let me restate that. They did this before these, these sessions, and then Right after it, 24 hours after it, and 48 hours after it, they measured the maximum voluntary contraction, rate of force development, their peak rate of force development, their counter movement jump height. So in other words, how high they could jump after landing. And then they also measured muscle soreness. Uh, for what it's worth, they also measured um, body composition before and after, but they saw no difference in that. But here's the interesting thing. Quote, significant interaction effects in favor of the SCP group were found. All And then this is me adding in here, all the below, and then this is a quote, recovered significantly faster in the SCP group. So they're all the things that I said before, their maximum voluntary contraction, how much force they could create and how far they could jump. After they had induced muscle damage, if you were taking collagen, you were able to return to baseline way faster than if you were not taking collagen. So basically, they were showing the fact that you could return to play or return to that standard of performance that you would set faster when they were measuring it right after 24 hours after and 48 hours after. It's faster with collagen. So that's an interesting thing. And maybe the insight there is that if we're like going from workout to workout, Nate, you were talking about the sore legs that you had mm -hmm. and everything else. Maybe this is a spot where collagen could help with that sort of a thing. Actually, it says no effects were found with muscle soreness and body composition. Oh, yeah. So not the soreness. Muscle soreness and body composition. Yeah. yeah but so the performance, your legs, yes. maybe not. Yeah. But the performance, yeah. Yeah. I'm curious. Uh, I'm curious what you think the difference that an athlete or elite athlete or um, just someone who trains a lot, my experience, since this was a sedentary group originally, like, mm -hmm. do you think that we maybe have already maxed out that ability, um, where collagen couldn't really add more to it? Or do you think, I, I have no idea. I'm yeah. curious what you think there. It's a good question. But, and I have a study it, on that. Ah, <laughs> but, also, uh, <laughs> but also like you bring a good point. It's not the elite kind of trained athlete. And two, this is something that we're not you don't do this in training. Hannah doesn't jump off to a box and then jump, you know, jump off to the ground. It's, it's a different type. And it's probably because it would be really hard to get these sedentary individuals to be like, Hey, go race uh, Leadville for me. Um, yeah. they just couldn't do it, right. They couldn't probably get the same kind of damage that Hannah does daily. Well, it's yeah. also curious, like if you're looking at running and sort of that like elasticity and then jumping, which would be similar, um, cycling is very different. There's not a lot of like momentum base in cycling. It, it seems like it because we're moving forward, but it's, there's no like that, you know, what I'm trying to say, what's the word yes, I'm looking totally. for? That elasticity impact, or the, right? um, that's mm -hmm. acceleration. Yeah. Jump spring. There you exactly go. Acceleration. Right. Yeah. 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 It's that rate momentum of force development. Change. 
yeah. right? Mm-hmm. You're not dealing with this, like having to move your entire body from one spot to the next. So, and I don't have a study for cycling. I was looking through, couldn't find one that was uh, anything recent that was looking at what really if collagen is effective. But this is the first study that I actually found that caused me to get curiosity and continue to dig through studies for this. This one uh, is looking at, this says, effects of specific bioactive collagen peptides in combination with concurrent training on running performance and indicators of endurance capacity in men. Now, the reason that they did this study is because there have been quite a few of these studies for women, but not for men. And across the board in women, the same findings from this study are reflected. So this is, uh, just want to make sure that's clear for the gender differences. This study reflects what they found in, in studies with women as well. Um, so this one, they had 32 men split into two groups. Now these men were, um, they were active individuals. I think that they had a VO2 max, I believe in this study, it was a 58 plus or minus. So these are people that are not sedentary individuals that, you know, so, um, and what they did is they had them do a 60 minute run and 15 minute resistance. And they did this, I believe it was three times per week. It was actually quite hard to see. Um, I wish that they would make these sort of things more frequent, but, but from what I could gather from piecing things together three times a week and then for 12 weeks. Then they had the collagen group take in every day, 15 grams of collagen, and the control group took a placebo of the same amount. And then here's how they tested things before and after the intervention, one, a one hour running time trial on the track and a until failure test on a running ergometer took place. So basically on the either side of this 12 week trial, uh, what they found when, so keep in mind control group and placebo group, both doing the exercise, right? Um, what they found is that, uh, they or forgive me on the track. They measured their running distance for that time trial. And then on the ergometer, they measured their velocity at lactate threshold and then their velocity at their individual anaerobic thresholds. They also measure body composition, but they found no difference in body composition again in this study, but effectively the results, the collagen group had statistically significant increases in their time trial distance, their velocity at lactate threshold and their velocity at anaerobic threshold. Now, Hannah, you pointed out what I was going to point out at the end of this one, how much of this is because of the quote, like springy nature of running that is unique to running perhaps and not to cycling. I don't know. Um, it'd be really cool to see. And if somebody can find a study, if I missed one on here, that's cycling and looking into the effectiveness of this, it'd be really interesting to see. It's also worth noting. I think a big caveat here is number one, I may be misunderstanding the research. Number two, the, the other side of things is these are really complex and I don't, I didn't see in any case where any of these were diet controlled. Mm. And I feel like the big question that also has to be asked here is were any of these people deficient on collagen beforehand for one reason or another? And then could this have had a bigger effect, um, for those individuals? So, cause collagen comes through various sources within our diet, or at least the stimulation of collagen production, uh, comes through many sources of our diet. So, uh, there's a lot of questions that like, this isn't like a perfect, you take collagen, this will happen, but it does seem consistent through the research that I was able to find that collagen production, at least for endurance athletes can even improve endurance performance, not just strength and your ability to recover between workouts. So, at the very least, it doesn't seem like it's bad, you know, um, and it does seem like it's something that could help. So it's pretty interesting to hear. Yeah. Um, two, to understand collagen is a protein, but it doesn't build muscle. So when you, you don't include it in your, if, if you're hitting a daily protein target, don't include it. Um, that could be pretty confusing. Um, yeah. Yeah, this is it. I used to take it and I stopped for some reason and it's sitting in my cabinet and I guess I'll just start taking it now. Basically, yeah. <laughs> the only downside is that we're aware of is your wallet. Yeah, exactly right. And potential upside. And it's not too cheap. Um, like mm-hmm. when you look at it in terms of other supplements, it's an expensive supplement. Um, there are vegan sources of collagen, but it's more common to find animal sources of collagen that come from particularly from like uh from 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 cows uh in particular. So um, and there's an important thing to find like a collagen peptide, like effectively like a complete profile one, um, collagen can come in various different ways and you can get very specific about how you're taking it. Um, but if it's not like a complete collagen peptide, then a lot of the time it's not going to give you the benefit. Also, there seems to be an assumption in the research. I haven't looked into it myself, but an assumption that co-ingestion with vitamin C is key, uh, yeah. with maximizing gains from collagen is, yeah. intake. So that's, uh, that's an important detail to, to keep in mind too. And some of them will put vitamin C in it. I'm looking at vital proteins, which is one in America we see a lot. That's $35 for a month supply of what is it? 27 um, yeah. Scoop says not cheap. Think of that compared yeah. to a trainer road subscription. Send yearly. I know, right? I know, right? With exactly red light, right. green light now. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. I know. Yeah. 
difference. The bang for the buck is huge. So thanks for asking this question. This is a great example of me just like glossing over something in my mind and then, uh, but it caused curiosity and cool insight to gain from it. So Hannah, thanks for joining us. I know you've got a hard stop and I want to give you some time to be able to get off in, in time for it. So thanks for joining us. Uh, what's next for you? What's the next race? Ooh, next race. Oh my gosh. That caught me off guard. Um, sea otter, I guess sea otter. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. It's a little ways away still. So lots of good training ahead. That's right. And if uh, you'd like to, you can follow Hannah uh, on Instagram. We'll link down below so you can find her there. Or you can just search for Hannah Auto. You'll find her that way. You can also see Hannah in the Lifetime Grand Prix Call of a Lifetime series that's airing now and showing the, the episodes. Very good. Very well done. It's cool to see Hannah in there. Um, so if you want to check all that stuff out, you can. Thanks, Hannah. If you have questions that you want to submit to the podcast, you can do so at trainerroad.com slash podcast. And if you haven't signed up for Trainer Road yet, Go do it now. Go turn on red light, green light. It's really fun to look back at your career. Uh, just as that person said, it's the closest thing you'll ever have to a coach looking at your training every single day and then making those changes. And that, my friends, is a very expensive coach. You can have it for 19 bucks a month instead. So, uh, all right, everybody. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye.